see if I'm, I hope I'm not missing. Okay, there's one question right at the back there. Let, let's sort of pass on the mic. So those are three. I think uh, Lawrence will take on that uh, beat about you know training. How do we enhance that? And uh, just uh, scaling it up. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much to the panel. See me, respite. Sorry, can everyone see me? Maybe I should stand. Um, Simi Urispa is my name, uh, Deputy Commissioner KRA, Alternative Dispute Resolution. Now, what, I mean, I, I really appreciate what we're talking about ADR and the benefits of ADR, friendly, cost effective, in our view, perspective at least from where I sit, time, and it also preserves relationships. But what I battle with is what are the challenges of the uptick? Because I feel whenever we talk about moving from the courtroom to the boardroom, ideally everyone should say, yay, I should go for arbitration, but why are we not seeing that uptake? Could it be that, and with all due respect to the legal fraternity because I'm one, could it be that there's a benefit for the lawyers to go more for litigation as opposed to arbitration? When you're looking at it from the tax perspective, because I also represent KRA, is that is it beneficial to the tax agents to go more for, you know, go to court, go to the tribunal, as opposed to going to the boardroom and resolving these disputes amicably. I would want to hear more on that. Thank you. Thank you. It's interesting that Carrie is here because this is a month to actually pay your taxes. So I'd hate to imagine how many cases you'd have pretty much at the end of the month inside. Let's pass over the mic to Madam Joyce right at the back. She's the head of consulting um, from the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Why? Um, I'd want to get Cam's perspective into this. You know, they represent an entire body of uh, business practitioners who are always in and out of court. Thank you, Laban. I'm from the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. It's a business membership organization for manufacturing value-add industries. We are quite pleased um, to listen to the debate around arbitration and mediation, and uh, specifically from Lawrence about the appropriate uh, dispute resolution mechanism. We have been challenged for quite a number of years with the ease of doing business, commercial courts taking so long to you know, pass on uh, these judgments, and we are really keen on following this process of ADR. And as a result, we are looking to partner with NCIA and other players to make sure that we make um, commercial disputes faster and uh, more efficient. We are looking towards uh, building business relations that will last. We have so many challenges uh, over the number of years that have been affecting how quickly businesses can uh, evolve and how partnerships can be strengthened. We would also want to start our own mediation center. We're in the process of actually launching, which we'll do in the next one month, and would like to partner with all the, part uh, the players here so that together we can make sure that business relations are strengthened and we can grow the economy together. We have a big challenge now around the big four agenda, which uh, the president is pursuing, and we want to work in all ways possible to make sure that businesses are thriving and managing conflicts where they arise. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you uh, to everyone who's interacted with us. Um, and now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm moving on to the kind of the final uh, remarks. And remember, if you just tuned into us uh, online, we're coming to you live from the Intercontinental Hotel, where we're just uh, discussing matters arbitration and just see how we can ease the pressure off the courts moving into the boardroom uh, as, of course, uh, pushing in arbitration as an alternative uh, dispute resolution mechanism. So please interact with us online, of course, with the hashtag top in business as we engage, especially in this final uh, bit of discussion. Lady gents, um, Lawrence, I think you have a lot of questions that you have to uh, take. Um, so I'm going to just push it on to you. How do you encourage youth uptake? How do you encourage you know, the issues about taxation? I'm going to ask Joshua to uh, tackle the issue of taxation. And Jerry, you can touch also on the issue about mentoring others, you know, just looking towards you know, the, that mind mindset shift as we go along. So, Lawrence, you go first. Uh, thank you again, Cliff, and thank you for the questions. Uh, with regards to what uh, do we do, especially with uh, the young uh, talent? Uh, and I've, I just mentioned about the uh, building um, a culture of training in alternative dispute resolution. We are engaged in academic institutions at universities so that we can have not only lawyers trained in alternative dispute resolution, but across disciplinary training of alternative dispute resolution. What do I mean by this? Ultimately, those who make decisions about where and how disputes will be resolved are not necessarily the lawyers. It is the 
a professional engineer, it is a professional architect, it is a business manager who eventually calls, uh, makes the call on how that dispute is going to be resolved. So we are deliberately treating uh, development of that talent from uh, the academic institutions as one of our pillars so that we can have uh, business-minded people live in campus who are already aware that alternative dispute resolution does exist and should be pursued. On the other side of it, the ones who actually uh, act as the administrators and managers of the process, the lawyers and the like, also similarly leave uh, university conscious of the existence of this other mode of dispute resolution. Uh, practically, and I think Jerry will add on to this, um, building a mentorship program so that when disputes eventually are referred to a center, uh, other requests, uh, of course, to the parties, respecting confidentiality, uh, this younger uh, upcoming talent can be involved in the entire process, uh, one, to understudy, to understand it, and eventually, of course, to grow, uh, to become practitioners in themselves. Um, we have a department uh, called the case management department. That's another area where, uh, through internship programs, uh, we can very well expose those who are seeking to enter into this field um, and into how the how about of doing it. Joshua, ease of doing business and uh, you know how this now will enhance that and I'm happy the issue of taxation was uh, brought about. I mean, let me agree that what John said earlier. I mean, we have a case today in arbitration of $50 million and because of the kind of confidentiality we were dealing with the client, we found it much better to have this matter appropriately delivered through arbitration, which is ongoing. But, but many times the reason why, I don't think in my view that at least uh, a lawyer's advice is to go to court. Many times as professionals we made a view that the relationship is so broken that there is no way of recovering it. And therefore the best way is to go to court and close the matter, get settled and close it. This is the original mindset that Jerry spoke about. Is we don't see the future, once a dispute arises in a contract, we don't, so, we don't see a way to actually recover it. Now, as a large taxpayer ourselves, I don't think we have not had an issue to go to court with KRA, for instance. Most of our issues have been resolved through. So we have a kind of a relationship that we can see that there's something better to resolve our issues amicably because we have a business to run. We have a model to operate in our markets today. So, and, and I would say that uh, this is perhaps the role of uh, the center in Nairobi, is to get much more ambassadors today in businesses. And it's not always lawyers who deal with, with conflict. Conflicts come up actually in a normal business, a relationship business, my engineer, my finance. That's where this was happened. Then they are thrown into a legal function and they say, let's go to court. So many times the professionals are not even aware at that time that there are many ways of addressing an issue that we face. And that is why many cases finally, it shouldn't be that when you enter into a contract, when there's a dispute, that we then end the relationship, which is most likely what happens. Many cases we've gone to court, the relationship has ended. Right? Even if it was one of our best relationships, we have no chance to recover it because everyone is, is quite upset. You know? Yet that's not the way we see the conversations. It's five years since we started as an industry, and I would say we see good progress. I mean, for us, we have a number of matters under arbitration. It's more to see our teams and what will work with you much more is to finding professionals who are largely in organizations making decisions are aware about this old, these options that are available. Remember that for 50 years, they have only owned one way. Yep. So we started that in 2013 when the center was saying, let's have a pilot, uh, which we did with the center. And we, my view is this is the way we need to be able to rebuild ourselves, quicken the resolution of issues. And in reality, there can't be one way of resolving a matter. This is what we need to be able to preach and speak much more. And also to the young lawyers today is to say, what options are available? And I'm quite excited that we see a resolution. I've been excited to see the... The prof the, the, what we want to do ourselves as a bank is, you know, we're revisiting all our agreements and a contract. You know, actually our dispute clause, social clause, is one of the smallest, shortest, and always the last. You know, and I said, but this is something, it's like we, it's an afterthought for ourselves. And then it doesn't defend where we actually place our kind of resolutions, which center, what professionals, what kind of regulations we're going to use. And that's something that I believe that's not just for a bank, but an industry, we should be able to build as a market. And, and I see a lot of work which has been done in South Africa. And that's what we're building ourselves to build. I say, don't go and reinvent the wheel. Build a process which has already been done and scale it up. So this is more like a hockey stick moment for the industry, for us to be able to scale up operational resolution management. All right. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, speaking of scaling up, actually, I would want to have a quick intervention from the Kenya Chinese Chamber of Commerce chairman. 
uh, Mr. Zobo will pass on the mic wherever you are. Over to you. But before we get to you, sir, um, Jerry, I think from a layman perspective, I know actually myself, even as a journalist, I can be an arbitrator. You know, just could maybe go up online, do a bit of a, uh, get a bit of certification and what have you. But um, just over to us, the issue about certi Jackie, you don't seem to agree with that. <laughs> I'm just from a layman perspective. And uh, the, the opportunities and just the way that the youth can actually uh, uh, plug in, especially in the training. And I think that is a, a bit from the Kenya School of Law. Well, um, the first thing, you cannot just go online and uh, get a bit of uh, information and become an arbitrator. It's an, a process. It's actually a process you must go through. Uh, there's a lot of learning. The only thing I want to... Um, in, uh, pass on is that you do not have to be a lawyer to be an arbitrator okay so just because um, the you can see on the NCI everybody's an LLB so on and so forth please it's a myth you can be an arbitrator if you come from another professional um, disposition um, and um, it, it, you just have to start right at the bottom and, and walk several steps right up to the top where you become a fellow or something like that or a chartered arbitrator. But it is a process you must go through and uh, for the, 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 the students at the Kenya School of Law, you've had a good foundation. Um, you've uh, started off with some information from university. I do know that there's some uh, um, courses on ADR and uh, many students are actually going through the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators um, courses to become both mediators and to become uh, arbitrators as well. Uh, you do have to spend money in order to do this, but please just, be, you're a journalist, you're a doctor, you're something else, there is something that you can do uh, in order to become an ADR specialist. So um, please don't feel that uh, I'm not a lawyer, so on and so forth, I can't do that. Um, there was another issue, I think, uh, that uh, Lawrence had been talking about, um, if, you, if you don't mind, I think it came from the KRA. Um, <coughs> we are able to engage as arbitrators and as mediators with the KRA and to assist you to resolve your disputes with your taxpayers. I know you must have several of them. Um, but um, there are ways through appropriate dispute resolution methods and mechanisms that um, you may be able to continue with your relationships with your taxpayers so on and so forth on a, on a, a very positive basis. Uh, the uptake by lawyers, I think the problem is that um, lawyers have thrived on the 30-year file. That's what I call it, where you keep a file in court for 30 years and each month you're going up for a, uh, um, for a mention. Can you please give me 10,000 shillings? Um, uh, you, that's what you tell the client, and uh, you, you thrive on the 10,000 shillings a month for 30 years. Whereas I think if we, we, we have this change of attitude that I spoke of earlier, and, and start to think in terms of volume, how many people will come knocking on your door if they hear that you have resolved 10 disputes in one month? So dear lawyers, my fellow colleagues, we have to change, have a paradigm shift in thinking and in our attitude change and start seeing that the more uh, disputes we resolve in a shorter time, the better our market will be. And I think I can only encourage, and I, although I have seen since our 2010 constitution a big change in, in lawyers' attitudes towards um, wanting to take up mediation, wanting to take up uh, ar arbitration courses, and uh, especially the young people, because of course they've had the exposure at the level of university. There are more lawyers more interested in ADR. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, gentlemen, I'm gonna come to you shortly for the closing remarks, but we have a quick intervention um, uh, from the Kenya uh, Chamber of, uh, actually the Kenya Chinese Chamber of Commerce and the Dubai uh, Chamber of Commerce, wherever you are. I'm told the microphones are with you right now. So um, yes, Mr. Wu, we can actually go first. I know uh, follow the one belt one road uh, initiative, initiative. More Chinese business people come here and more investment here. I believe a lot of disputes will come in the future. 
So I think this uh, Nairobi Center for International Arbitration is very good, especially this Kajak. Uh, uh, but I've, I have one more question. It's like most of Chinese, they don't understand uh, the English language. So in the future, you know, sometimes, I believe uh, very few Chinese, they go to court themselves, but most time is the Kenya, the partners, or maybe they took them to court. So I used to convince them to come to arbitration. But the problem is what language is, is also is a problem. So how can we, to like this Kajak, can get some Chinese language arbitrator can help them to settle the problem? I just want to know whether they uh, have this plan or not. Thank you. All right. Let's hear from the Dubai Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Yes, give me a appreciate, Mr. Wu. Thank you, Mr. Michael Gaido. Where are you at? Uh, from the Dubai Chamber of Commerce. All right. There we go. Just pass on the mic over to you. Um, I think uh, Dr. Cherry can take that um, question on language, and I don't know if Loris is okay. It's okay. All right. Just so I think you'll do it as you give your closing remarks. All right, Mr. Gaito, over to you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Michael. Michael Gaido, head of Dubai Chamber of Commerce, Kenya office. Uh, let me say that this is a very good initiative, and uh, just to pick from what one of the panelists said. Um, indeed, and just to mention this, that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and of course Kenya being part of these countries, is among some of the uh, fastest growing economies in the world. And for this reason, as the, the, this part of the world becomes more attractive to investors, then of course alternative dis dispute region becomes one major area to look at. Now Dubai has excelled very well in this area, and as you all know, Dubai is a major business and uh, investment hub not only for the, uh, the GCC countries, but of course for Africa as well. And as this happens, as more people are finding their footing in uh, Dubai and of course in Africa, dispute resolution becomes a major thing. Let me say that from my experience as, a, as, a, as an office here in Kenya, of course we've engaged many companies in Kenya who are doing business with Dubai or even exporting or importing from, du from Dubai. And uh, of course, in the course of doing business, there are many challenges, uh, which again, Definitely, if they were to go to Dubai to solve, solve some of these issues, it would be costly. Getting to courts, getting to hire lawyers, I mean, uh, outside the country is, co of course, expensive. But uh, as a country, and as Kenya, I mean, as, as a country, it's important for us to think about dispute resolution. Let me say this, uh, having worked, of course, in the chamber before, the biggest challenge we have with companies today is that uh, in uh, enforcing contracts or even in signing MOUs, it becomes just one of the major crosses put there. But pe people don't pay attention to details on that particular part because it's important. When you are signing a contract on MOU, of course, you always include, uh, of course, we're going to go for tactic dispute resolution and everything else. But when challenges come, even, and I think someone asked what is the challenge in the, in the uptake, people always resolve to go to court, forgetting that there's a clause, a provision that gives them an, an alternative way to handle commercial issues. And it is something that we need to think about, and especially for SMEs. We have a growing industry in SMEs. Now, if we cannot have an, uh, a proper uptake of this, it's going to be very hard even to uh, enable, empower SMEs to move into that direction. Thank you. Appreciate it. One final round of applause, and thanks for that intervention. Thank you, uh, representing the Dubai uh, Chamber of Commerce. Really quickly, yes, I see you. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just, uh, there's a hand here just at the front. Um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, so, uh, firstly, my, uh, my name is April Longjiwing. I'm from uh, Standard Charter Bank. I'm based in Kenya, so uh, I help the bank to manage the Chinese investors. So, uh, there are two questions. Uh, the first is, um, uh, actually, we've talked about, about uh, why, we, uh, come f why we change from the, the court to the boardroom. Uh, but then, uh, with the launch of uh, CJAC, uh, what are the specific changes that we see in Nairobi? For example, uh, previously we also have the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. Now, with, the, with CJAC, what are the specific changes that the Chinese investor and also the Kenyan businessmen are expecting? That's the first question. And the second question is, uh, out of my curiosity, so there are, uh, I know uh, CJAC is launched in Beijing, uh, Johannesburg, and uh, Shenzhen, and all these cities. So I think uh, Nairobi is the second city in Africa. So why do you choose, choose Nairobi instead of uh, 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 Carroll 
or Mauritius or Nigeria. Just, I think this also speaks of uh, how Nairobi is in uh, Chinese uh, investors' um, uh, mind. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. All right. Gentlemen, you see you have a lot of questions to ask. Let's, let's appreciate her, I think, uh, uh, representing especially the back inside. So, Shane, um, over to you, you know, why Nairobi is uh, looked at vis-a-vis uh, -vis other countries and other markets uh, in Africa. And then, you, of course, Doc, you're going to give our final remarks and over to Lawrence. I think the probable reason why Nairobi is looked at uh, over others is, is one of the fundamental reasons that any commercial entity looks at in deciding where they want to invest and that's confidence in the market confidence in the judiciary and with conf confidence comes out of certainty and credibility and 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 nigeria ticks all those boxes so i think it was it was a bit of a no-brainer um i think if i may just add one little thing to what was raised earlier on because i think it's it's fundamental to what arbitration is about we talk about alternative dispute resolution, and we talk about the escalation of disputes. So we talk about it starting with amicable settlement and then escalating in the construction sector where I am to adjudication, then escalating to arbitration. The irony is all that's escalating is the cost because what is not escalating is the involvement of the parties. And that is why in litigation where it's handed over to counsel and it's handed over to attorneys, the parties are very far removed and hence relationships break down totally because there's no longer a relationship involved. It's legal minds playing chess. And I think that is really the beauty of arbitration. What arbitration offers with a, an experienced arbitrator who would be able to understand not only the topic but the party's interests and to, to implement it. So I, I, I really think the on in answer, so I've done a round circle in, in to why, why Nairobi, but I think it, it ticks all those boxes of certainty, credibility, reliability, and certainty. What everyone in every jurisdiction looks to is whether the judiciary in, embraces arbitration. And from my understanding, it is something that the Nairobi, that it, in, in, in Kenya, the judiciary is pro arbitration, and that is a huge benefit. Thank you, Shane. Um, lastly, uh, Dr. Chen, so it's just a question on language, maybe perhaps a b issue about language barrier and uh, the potential of Kajak. I think there's an interest, there's now bears in the market, and what do you actually see um, it in enhancing um, arbitration? Okay, finally it's my turn. So why, the first question, let me back, uh, why uh, BAC uh, ch uh, choose uh, Nairobi as a Kajak uh, partner center? My answer is simple, why not? <laughs> <laughs> For the language, yeah, it's very important uh, uh, negotiating uh, point when you uh, 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 negotiate the contract. And for the, uh, you actually, the statistics from uh, issued by uh, the renowned international arbitration institutions recently shows that actually there's an increasing case though using Chinese as an arbitration language. So actually it's Basically, it's based on both parties' uh, negotiation. Uh, if you use Chinese, probably you, you, you will uh, 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 give up in other side in something. Uh, so it depends on their bargaining power. For the mission of Kajat, actually, we try to actually we try to develop an arbitration mechanism uh, with China in African uh, characteristic. That means we hope we can better meet the expectations in perceptions of arbitration users from China in Africa. So the, to read the concerns, if it's one thing to reduce the concern from uh, potential users is arbitration actually only as good as arbitrator. It could, be, it could be run in quite different style. It could be very lengthy in high cost, yes. So for the budget, actually we probably we should I, I always say we, we, we need a training program for arbitrators. Uh, and so that make there's a large pool of arbitrators. Both uh, could uh, qualify to handle this field, both in Beijing or in Nairobi, in Johannesburg, in Shanghai, in, in Shenzhen. So yeah, so we will work together in better meet the expectations of uh, uh, every user. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please appreciate my panelists and uh, those quick reactions that we've had. I would want to...
um, just uh, go over to what is actually uh, coming out and to this uh, discussion that we've had. Of course, this is the first of its kind, which I'm sure NCI will have a lot of uh, uh, stakeholder engagement just trying to uh, enhance this. Of course, misconceptions about arbitration, um, really seeing, you know, that phrase that, you know, let's settle it in court to actually move into, let's settle it uh, in the boardroom. So I want to thank you all very much for your time. I'm just going to close it up to, uh, to uh, Lawrence just to encapsulate and maybe just maybe give uh, kind of key commitments that maybe NCI will, you know, have and actually do to enhance this uh, going forward. And uh, to any investor out there who's looking at it and uh, they actually, you know, there's that fear of investment, you know, based on the legislative landscape in the country and how you demystify that uh, as you give the closing remarks. Um, thank you, Cliff. You said it well. Business wants certainty and reliability of processes and procedures. No one wants to put in money where they are not sure of their return. And part of the bargain is how can they unlock disputes when they arise. Nairobi Center for International Arbitration is saying we are in that space. Nairobi is ready for business. You ask why Nairobi? More than just what has been mentioned is the connectivity of Nairobi to the rest of the region. The infrastructure that supports the service of dispute resolution, be it internet, be it the mobile te uh, telephony, all that put together and to crown it, I think there's no dispute. We are in a jurisdiction which can no doubt be called um, one that holds an independent judiciary, a judiciary that is supportive of processes of arbitration by case law and by many other examples. So what are we committing to this market? And I wish to uh, echo here the sentiments of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers and a question that was asked by Lindy with this example. I arrive in Beijing, I go to a law firm and I ask them, when you want to deal with a business in Nairobi, what do you do? And this is the response. I call a law firm in Paris, France. The law firm in Paris calls a law firm in one of the cities in Africa, not Nairobi. And then that law firm in that city calls a law firm in Nairobi to ask it what is the law of Kenya. And so to the response in terms of what will this new project, uh, the KJA project, to moderate those nuances, those differences, so that the lawyer in Nairobi and the lawyer in Beijing now have a better understanding of the differences in their legal cultures. One. What about Nairobi Center for International Arbitration on its part? We in this market are the only providers of what you call administered arbitration. You refer the dispute to the center, we manage the dispute uh, for you and the tribunal and eventually ensure that what comes out is what can be enforced. At the end of the day, what you want is, that, is an award that can be enforceable. Kenya is signatory to the New York Convention that was mentioned here. So you conduct an arbitration in Kenya or with Kenya as a seat of arbitration, it can be enforced in any one of those states which are signatory uh, to uh, the convention. And then we are going to provide the infrastructure so that when you want to resolve a dispute um, with at very minimal and reasonable rates but customized uh, infrastructure, you can have your dispute resolved even including using the internet. You don't have to move from one country to another. It can be resolved in the comfort of the bedroom. Thank you very much, Lawrence. One clap. <laughs> Joshua, thank you. Joshua and Jerry, Shane, Dr. Shen, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And thank you also to you, the audience, uh, for creating time to be with us. And of course, 
those of us who've tuned into these discussions uh, on television and on our online platforms, we really want to appreciate. Remember, you've had these discussions first on top in business. This is just looking towards how do we engage, especially with the business community, understand what are some of the issues uh, ongoing. And today, it's uh, for the first of its kind, and we have for the first in this country, is indeed um, moving from the courts uh, to the boardroom. Of course, of course uh, the conversation that we've been having uh, from the Intercontinental Hotel. Remember, this is a conference that's actually taking place right here. This is the first day of its kind, and we're going to have a lot more deliberations ongoing. It will be interesting to also hear what the Chief Justice has to say about this, and we're also expecting the Solicitor General also um, uh, shortly. So it is a start of many to come, and of course this could not have happened without the support from the Nairobi uh, Center for International Arbitration. My name is Laban Cliff, and on behalf of uh, the producer Debbie and my director Arnold, who brought these proceedings to you live, I want to wish you a good day ahead and a good week. And remember, move away from the cost of the boardroom. Thank you. on sports. What is that? Huge winnings. What is that? High odds. What is that? Fast pay. What is that? What is that? The Becker Company. The Wicked Edition. Tithe does not belong to development of church. Tithe is forever. It's, it's mine and mine alone. Ata sahi, niko hapa, si jahesabu, ziko kwa gari. It's mine, but they're offering. Yes. It's for the church work. Does that mean that all these pastors who claim that wana ukipeana pesa inenda kwa mungu ama unatoa unatolea mungu, they lie to their people. Kasi yetu wa hubiri ni kukura na mungu ajase manyugu. The Wicked Edition, tonight, 